Welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's Science Watcher is Dr. Tomoko Tashiro of Aoyama Gakuin University. Hello, I'm glad to be here with you today. Here is today's lineup. Today on The Leading Edge, we have a closer look at fatigue. Research on fatigue is progressing rapidly. New discoveries are being presented, such as the serious effect it has on the brain and a new mechanism that leads to a serious level of fatigue. We'll also take a look at a substance that is expected to aid in fatigue recovery. Fatigue is something that most of us have struggled with. Today, we'll be learning more about it. And on J Innovators, Michelle? This week's Takumi invented a revolutionary catheter that makes complicated endoscopic procedures easier to manage. Common complaints about conventional endoscopes were that they were hard to wash, had weak suction, and were hard to see with. The Takumi solved all these issues with an innovative product that is the first of its kind in the world. The Takumi's catheter makes operations less taxing for patients. We'll find out how he did it. But first, today's Science News Watch. This week, I was interested to hear that the research group announced that they've discovered the gene that regulates a flower's lifespan. The discovery came through a joint study held by the National Agriculture and Food Research Organization's Institute of Floricultural Science in Tsukuba City, Ibaragi Prefecture and Kagoshima University. The research group focused on morning glories due to their short lifespan and observed how the genes functioned from the time the flowers bloomed in the morning to when they wilted in the evening. They found that a gene called EPH1 was especially active when the flowers wilted. When they suppressed the gene EPH1 through genetic engineering, the flower's lifespan went from an average of 13 hours to 24 hours, almost doubling their lifespan. This confirmed that the gene was involved in the flower's aging process. The research group believes that this gene may also be regulating the lifespan of other flowers and hopes to develop a drug that will suppress the gene and allow flowers to bloom for longer. This study revealed an interesting point. Animal cells are also known to die rapidly after receiving a signal to initiate cell death. For example, when a tadpole metamorphoses into a frog, Programmed cell death plays an active part in absorbing the tadpole's cave. So cell death plays a big part in the transition between life stages. From this study, I realized that the petals withering represented a transition between life stages. And now for the leading edge. So today's topic is about something that everyone experiences, tiredness or fatigue. And research regarding fatigue seems to be progressing steadily. Yes, it is. Fatigue is a widespread problem here in Japan. According to a survey held in Japan, 60% of the respondents said they were tired, of which 40% were suffering from chronic fatigue, continuing over six months. I'm afraid that may be true. A lot of the people I know tell me that they're constantly exhausted. From 1999, the Japanese government began a research project on fatigue. Through it, they are learning more about what fatigue really is. Tomoko, do you ever feel exhausted? Yes, of course. Like after each show, I'm pretty wiped out. When that happens, wouldn't you like to know how tired you are in comparison to others? Yes, I guess it would be helpful if there was a way to know when you're pushing yourself too far. Then you could stop before entering the danger zone. Yes, it would. Research is currently being conducted on a way to quantify fatigue levels. Let's see how they were able to show fatigue in numbers. We visited a research site to get the latest information. I visited Osaka City University Hospital, which has a division that specializes in fatigue. Hello! Nice to meet you. Hello. Thank you for your time. Hirohiko Kuratsune has been studying a way to convert fatigue levels into numerical form for over 20 years. 
I took two tests that are able to quantify my fatigue level. The first involved this small device that you put your fingertip inside. All I had to do was put my finger inside and sit still for a while. Okay, it's done. Oh, that's it? The device took my pulse to assess my autonomic nerve activity. This graph shows the results. The green part on the right shows when I'm relaxed, while the red part on the left shows the state of my autonomic nerves, which are activated when I become tense. He is able to quantify my fatigue level by calculating the ratio. My rate at the time was 1.614. This test paper was the second test. I just had to put it in my mouth for 30 seconds. It measures how much of a substance called beta amylase is in my saliva. The higher the stress level, the more beta amylase is secreted. My rate at the time was 50. Based on these numbers, how big of a change will there be when I'm tired? Let's find out. I was placed in front of a computer. This computer would put me through a nightmarish experience. Ah! Math problems began appearing on screen. I was told to input the last digit of the answer. And if I didn't answer in two seconds, a loud alarm sound would go off. And this math test was 90 minutes long. Can you believe it? A whole 90 minutes. It was kind of fun at first. However, an hour later, I was feeling dejected. Towards the end, I started getting lightheaded. I was completely exhausted. Then it was finally over. I would try to choose one number, but accidentally click the wrong one. In order to think, I'm really tired. Are my eyes bloodshot? Are they okay? I'm completely wiped out. Having ended the 90-minute session, I repeated the two tests. The result of the autonomic nerve activity test, which indicates my fatigue level, was 3.619. It was two times higher than my rate prior to the math session. My beta amylase rate was 62. The intense stress I had gone through made it go up. Just then... Please start now. Oh, really? Oh, I wasn't ready for that and chose the wrong one. I had to solve math problems for another 90 minutes. I was not expecting this second round. The doctor told me that this was the last session, so I pushed myself to the limit. Good work. Finally. Thank God it was finally over. My beta amylase level was now 24. A rush of relief at being released from the grueling math problems caused my stress level to go down. But my exhaustion had reached its peak. Autonomic nerve activity had increased and the rate displayed was even higher than before. I saw my fatigue level in clear numbers. It's difficult to look at person A and person B and compare their fatigue levels. Numbers provide us with an objective perspective and allow us to evaluate how exhausted we really are. I think that's necessary. From here, we need to find out what combination of numbers will provide us with the most accurate way to assess fatigue 
which can otherwise be very vague and nondescript. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Well, instead of just saying I'm tired, if we could see the level of fatigue in numbers, that would be helpful. You would know exactly how tired you are. Some say that fatigue is a subject that has long been overlooked by medical science and medical care. Doctors would normally just tell you to go home and rest or sleep it off. It wasn't directly addressed before, but now it's finally getting the attention it deserves. Dr. Tashiro, is there a difference between physical fatigue and mental fatigue? Are they two different types? Fatigue is caused by a combination of factors, so it's hard to say. But regardless of whether it's caused by strenuous exercise or mental exhaustion, signals are sent to your brain telling it that you are tired, and that's why you feel fatigue. So there must be changes happening in the brain. So how is the brain affected by fatigue? It turns out that there is some surprising activity. Let's find out what it is. Masaaki Tanaka of Osaka City University has been working with the National Institute for Physiological Sciences on the connection between the brain and fatigue. The research project, which has spanned three years, revealed unexpected facts about how the brain reacts to sensory stimulation. They used a device called an fMRI to see which part of the brain becomes active. For the test, the participants were shown a number. Next, they would make a split-second assessment about whether the number was included in the next display. By holding the test with fatigued participants and healthy participants, they would be able to compare the difference in how their brains responded. Tanaka expected the visual cortex, which handles visual stimulation, to be less active in those experiencing fatigue. The results took him by surprise. This yellow area was where the biggest difference appeared between fatigue participants and healthy participants. It was the auditory cortex. The lengthy visual stimulation did not affect the auditory function of healthy participants, but the auditory function of the fatigue participants deteriorated drastically. Why was the auditory cortex affected by visual stimulation? When a part of the brain is exhausted, it sends out a signal indicating that it's tired. The signal is sent to a certain brain region, which then sends a signal back instructing the exhausted region to rest. Normally, the signal to rest is issued directly to the exhausted region. But if the fatigue level is too high, then the signal is sent to other regions as well causing unrelated functions to slow down. They also learned a new and interesting fact about the brain and fatigue. Tanaka and his team are trying to identify the mechanism of fatigue by studying the changes in the brain's electric current when a stimulus is provided. They set up a red light to blink continuously. They then monitored how the brain's electric current responded to the visual stimulus. This is the brain immediately after stimulus. The contour lines shift every millisecond and indicate the electric current in the brain. The higher the concentration of lines, the stronger the electric current is in the brain. Results show that fatigued participants had denser lines compared to healthy participants. The electric current was almost twice as strong. They received the same visual stimulus, but their brain was working twice as hard. This shows that when a person is fatigued, their brain tries to overcompensate and this tires them out further. In my opinion, the most outstanding mechanism is that being in a state of fatigue, particularly chronic fatigue, affects other areas besides the activated region or the region that is under pressure. 
So instead of caring for or calming the hyperactive region, it becomes necessary to give attention to other areas as well. What kind of attention is necessary and how to ultimately treat and overcome chronic fatigue is something I would like to keep working on and study further. That is a little scary. What happens to the brain if fatigue keeps building up? This is an extreme case. But this is the brain of an individual with chronic fatigue syndrome observed from above and behind. Notice the areas in orange? Researchers have found that these areas began to shrink. In other words, they decreased in volume. That doesn't sound very good. Um, is this shrinking irreversible or does it go back to normal? Research has found that in chronic fatigue syndrome sufferers, the stronger the fatigue, the more those areas shrink. When an individual recovers from chronic fatigue, those areas of the brain go back to their original size. That's a relief to hear. And is there any way to actively recover from fatigue? Unfortunately, there isn't a single cure that will work for everyone. But we do know that antioxidation is a vital part of the mechanism for fatigue recovery. Will we find a solution for chronic fatigue? We visited the front lines of research where they are searching for substances that will help us recover from fatigue. A study is being held to test the effects of antioxidants and to search out ones that have an outstanding effect. This is project leader Osami Kajimoto. Kajimoto is gathering candidate substances from various research institutes and corporations and testing the effects of each one individually. Antioxidants that were believed to assist in fatigue recovery were his subjects. There were over 20 types. Upon analysis, he found that a certain substance that most people are familiar with was surprisingly effective in fatigue recovery. 20 participants rode bicycles for three and a half hours. By gauging the participants' pedaling strength immediately after the workout and after a rest session, the research team would be able to see how well the substances worked. The participants who had not taken the particular substance showed decreased pedaling power even after the rest session. Meanwhile, the participants who had taken the substance showed a noticeable recovery in their pedaling power. I want to begin testing new substances and scientifically analyze any that are found to have an actual effect. I want to find effective substances and let the world know about it. I'm really curious now. What was the substance that had a fatigue recovery effect? Well, he tested over 20 substances and each one had some kind of effect. But the one that worked the best for recovering strength after exercise was a substance called imidazole peptide. And where can you find that substance? There's a high concentration in chicken, especially breast meat. 100 grams has all that you need per day. But it exists in all skeletal muscles, including ours. Well, that's good to know. I hope that research continues and that they find other new substances that will help people recover from fatigue. The cause and degree of fatigue is different for each person, and what they need to recover is also different. I think one day we'll be able to measure these things and create personalized recovery plans. Michelle, today's Takumi makes this. It's a catheter, a medical implement used in endoscopic surgeries. Surgeries that use a small camera to see inside the body are called endoscopic surgeries. A catheter is used by passing it through the endoscope's tube and extending it through the tip next to the lens. It's an important tool that is used to clean the affected area so that there is better visibility and spread drug solutions. The conventional catheters had a flaw.
This is Rito City, Shiga Prefecture. For over 60 years, this medium-sized company has manufactured large-scale machine tools for car and ship production. They manufacture many products that require a high level of precision. Hello, I'm Michelle Yamamoto. Oh, uh, hello. Today's Takumi or innovator is Makoto Hosaka. His fascination with the enormous machines that he saw at an automobile manufacturer as a high school student led him to join this company. Since then, he spent close to 20 years creating machine tools. I was told that the catheter that you created is different from conventional ones. What makes it different? Doctors had to have a high level of skill to be able to use conventional catheters. What could he mean? This is an image of a conventional endoscopic catheter. It has a hole at the tip, but there were some complicated problems. For one, when cleansing the affected area, the cleansing liquid could only be sprayed out in one direction. To distribute it equally over the target area, they had to keep changing the direction of the scope. There was also a problem with the suction. The catheter had to be pulled out of the endoscope for the suction function to work. And the lens had to be immersed in the liquid while the suction was in progress. As you can see, visibility was lost during the suction procedure. The problem had been highlighted by a particular clinician for some time. The mechanism of endoscopes has remained unchanged for many decades. So the procedure relied heavily on the surgeon's skill and competence. Kiyokazu Nakajima had an idea on how to solve this problem, but did not know how to go about making it a reality. Around the same time, the Takumi's company, which made machining tools, was thinking of entering the medical device market. A committee in Japan that specializes in introducing corporations to medical institutes brought them together. But product development was no easy task. This is the catheter design that Nakajima had in mind. He wanted the catheter to have a hundred holes so that the cleansing liquid could be sprayed evenly onto the target area. So the Takumi made this. It had 40 holes. When the water is sprayed from the catheter, as you can see, the holes are too close, so the water merges together and turns into thick streams. This was no good. How did he get the catheter's water to spray out evenly and with sufficient force? The answer was in the number and size of the holes. This is the Takumi's final product. It has 24 holes. Each hole is 0.4 millimeters in diameter. When the water is sent through... Whoa. Oh, how beautiful! The water sprays out evenly and has sufficient pressure. Drug solutions could now be distributed without the turning motion that was needed for conventional catheters. But that's not the best part. With conventional endoscopes, the catheter had to be withdrawn during the suctioning procedure. The Takumi solved this problem by giving the catheter a suctioning function. So. Ooh. Ooh. This makes it possible for them to remove fluids without clouding the lens. Thanks to this catheter, 
We can now detect small lesions that were hidden under the elementary canal waste. I believe this will help us detect cancer more accurately. We asked the Takumi what his philosophy is on manufacturing. For me, it's not about creating flashy ideas or techniques. It's about steady work and creating things that are useful. That's what's important to me. Dr. Nakajima used the Takumi's catheter and said that it was extremely handy and practical. For example, because they no longer have to remove the catheter each time they need to suction fluids, he feels that it reduces the operation time. It's an all-in-one tool that can cleanse, suction, and spray drug solutions. So he told me that it was easier and simpler to handle. A shorter operation time must also mean less strain for the patient, which is a major advantage. The shape of the endoscope has remained virtually unchanged since it was first invented. And at the time, they were created mainly for examination purposes. But now they are used to cut the affected part, apply medicine, and conduct other procedures. So it wasn't keeping up with medical progress. The Takumi's catheter is a combination of the doctor's experienced opinions and the engineer's desire to create a better instrument. So I think it's an outstanding product. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Tashiro, how would you wrap up today's topic about the science behind fatigue? How people experience fatigue differs according to the individual. And I've heard that many chronic fatigue patients struggle with being labeled as lazy when they are honestly too exhausted to function. And some will ignore their fatigue and keep pushing themselves even though they are reaching their limit or be forced to push themselves to the limit. And this can lead to accidents or in worst case scenarios to death from overwork. So it's very important that we find a method for objectively rating fatigue levels. It's good to hear that the mechanism behind what happens in the brain and how it can lead to a lack of sleep, aches, and other health problems is steadily being clarified. That's all for Science View. See you next time.